Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast. In particular today, I'm going to highlight The War. It's our World War II podcast in which we examine the war through radio from pre-war isolationism through the war and into some post-war reflections. It's a 277 episode journey. You can find it over at thewar.greatdetectives.net and you can find all of our podcasts over at the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio homepage at greatdetectives.net. Now it's time to start a new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. We will be playing episodes 1 and 2 today and episodes 3 through 5 on Friday. So if you want to listen to all five episodes together, you can just hit pause and then uh, come back to this on Friday. The original air dates... April the 9th and April the 10th of 1956. And this one is the Lair Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Oh, hi, Harry. What's on your mind? I have a case for you, a very important one. Good. Tell me about it. John, did you ever hear of Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Lord, who... Say that slowly, will you? Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. Sorry, I left my kilts and bagpipes on the other side of the drink. Huh? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling real sharp this morning. But what about this Laird Douglas Douglas something or other? Uh, can you come down here to Philadelphia and see me? I hate to be so blunt about it, old boy, but what's in it for me? A nice retainer fee in any event. Well, good. And, of course, expenses and your regular commission if anything happens to Laird Douglas Douglas. Of Heatherscope. Uh, why, yes. Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Oh, oh John. Yeah? Uh, come down by plane, will you? The first one you can get. Urgent, huh? Yes, John. Very. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Harry Branson at the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter, whoever Laird Douglas Douglas is, and whether investigation is the proper term at this point, who knows. In any event, well... <laughs> Expense account item one, 2250, air transportation and miscellaneous, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. For a change, I decided to stay at the Benjamin Franklin, not only because it was convenient to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street, that is the office of Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, but because I'd heard it was a nice hotel. It was. And it was convenient to everything else in the center of town. Theaters, good restaurants, nice stores, even a nightclub. Well, anyhow, when I got to my room, I found a half dozen urgent messages that Harry had called. Pretty good indication that his lordship, Douglas Douglas of, or at least this case, was pretty important. So instead of bothering to unpack, I had the bellboy dump my luggage, tipped him, and was standing there debating whether I'd better forego a quick shower and change of clothes when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. John, didn't you get my messages? Why haven't you called? I've been waiting to hear from you. What's wrong? Hey, take it easy, Harry. I just this minute got in. Oh. Well, I hope you're coming right on over here to my office. What's the matter? Something happened to this client of yours? No, not yet. But being you, you're expecting the worst, huh? And look, you still haven't told me a thing about this emergency or whatever you want to call it. John, it is an emergency because of the time element. You see, why do we waste time on the phone? Well, this was your call, not mine. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I'll be waiting for you. And Harry, I'll be there. Still knowing nothing whatsoever about what was going on, I decided I'd better be prepared for anything. So I slipped a thirty-eight cold out of my bag and took it along. Expense account item two, 65 cents, cab fare. I've said it before when I handled the Amerigo case for him. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a worrywart. 
So I kind of hoped he was making the usual mountain out of the usual molehill this time. However, when my cab pulled up in front of his office building, he was standing waiting on the sidewalk out front. Hey, I keep the change. Thank you, sir. John, John, what took you so long? Huh? Thank goodness you're here. Harry, what are you doing out here? Lose your office or just forget the key? I almost wish I had. John, we have a problem. A serious one. Yeah, with Laird Douglas, Douglas of, uh... Heatherscoat, Heatherscoat. He's up in my office yeah, now. Sounds like international intrigue. Has Scotland declared war on us or something? This is no time for levity. He's up in the office now, and you must take over immediately. This is a very serious situation. Come. Okay. Oh, now, what's it all about? Has Laird Douglas died and... Oh, no, no, you said he was up in your office. And I'm sure you don't mean just his body. Yes, he's there with Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Kelly Van... Huh? Are you kidding? I certainly am not. You see, she insists that you act as his bodyguard. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for you... 13th floor, please. Yes, sir. Unfortunately... I said 13th floor, operator. Please, quickly. Yes, sir. So, Harry? Unfortunately... Young man, will you please start this elevator immediately? Gotta wait for the signal, sir. Signal? This is an emergency. Take off! Immediately! Emergency? Yes, it involves Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, well, sure, if it's... Who? Good man, good man. (sighs) Okay. Now, you were saying, Harry... Uh, Was I? Uh, unfortunately something. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Fortunately for you, she was quite cognizant of the fact... Who was cognizant? Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. She knew about the excellent work you did for us in connection with the Ricardo Amerigo case not long ago. Excellent detective work, she called it. Thirteenth floor. You remember the case, Ricardo, the concert violinist who disappeared, presumably. Yeah, I remember. And your almost intuitive deduction that he wasn't dead at all, but had merely staged the whole thing to make it Uh, look as the... Ah, Harry. Oh, yes, of course. Thirteenth floor. You mean uh, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van... Excuse me, mister, but I'm getting signals from the other floors. Mm, Quite right, you should. As I started to say, John... She is one of our biggest personal policy holders. Good, good. But uh, hadn't we better get into your office and meet her? Oh, yes, yes. But I want you to know about the personal premiums. Alone, they run to something over $20,000 a year. Mr. Please. Well, she is an important client. Yes, yes. And that's why I didn't... Mr. Williams, I didn't hesitate to accede to her request that you be called in on this case. I called you and here you are. Mr. Please. Hmm? Oh, well, get us up to the... Oh, oh, we're here. Why didn't you tell us? Come, John. Mister, if I was to tell you what I'd like to, I... My office is right this way, John. Come, please. Hey, look, you better calm down, Harry, and give me the dope on this case right from the beginning. Yes. Yes, I'd better. All right. Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is a very important client. Has been for years. So you said. But there are a lot of things you haven't said, like... uh... What has she got to do with this Laird Douglas character, and why is he so important? It's this way, John. The policy on him runs to $5,000. No double indemnity, which is good. As a matter of fact, the policy on him was purely a favor to Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. You know, considering such short life expectancy and all. No, I don't know. Is he in his dotage or something? Well, hardly. Or are you being facetious again? But you said... Hey, how old is he? His birthday is next month, May 7th to be exact. He'll be four years old. Four? That's right. Short life expectancy? Of course, you see, John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, some horrible disease or something, huh? What's the matter with him? John, you wanted this from the beginning, so I'll give it to you from the beginning. Okay, but Harry, If it you're... hadn't been for Mrs. Van Pyten's own policies totaling something in the neighborhood of half a million, uh, more in fact... Harry... Why, we'd never have written the one on Lord Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat. So, now we've cleared that up. Harry, we passed your office three or four doors ago. Hmm? Oh, yes. But uh, as I'm sure you understand, I wanted to give you some of the background before you talk with Mrs. Van Pyten. After all, you asked for it. Yes, yes, I guess I did. But uh, what you've given me so far has landed me smack dab in the Department of Utter Confusion. And I'm beginning to think maybe I have company. Oh, where? Who? Right here. You, Harry. Now, look. Why don't we quietly stroll into your office and let me get the whole thing from Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten herself? Or better still, from Laird Douglas Douglas. But you couldn't. Of course not. What? At least not from him. Why not? John, will you please stop joking? Who's joking? This is serious business, very. (sighs) Look, Harry. Yes? There is one thing I'd like to talk over before we go in to see him. Them, somebody. Yes? Well, apparently the life and or welfare of this Laird Douglas Douglas is in danger. Oh, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. 
I thought I'd made that very clear to you. Yeah, well, you said you've written only a $5,000 policy on him. That's right, $5,000. And purely yeah, as a... Yeah, 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 I know all about that. Now, look, I don't want to seem crass about it, Harry, but my commission, if anything were to happen to him, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Which is precisely why I told you you will be paid a retainer while you're on the case. A most generous one. A generous one? By you? By Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. How much? Well, John, <clears throat> now mind you, this may not require your services for more than a week or so. As bodyguard, that is. How much? And, of course, she has authorized an expense account. Ah. But, mind you, John... Not the usual kind that you seem to have the knack of piling up beyond all reason. Clearly, a completely honest, legitimate accounting... Harry, that... how much? Well, as a matter of cold fact, I have assured her that it will total no more than the amount of the retainer she is prepared to pay you. Any more than that, and, uh, well, you'll have a lot of explaining to do. Harry, how much is this retainer to be, if I take the case? I might even go so far... $750 per week, or a fraction thereof, and I am sure you will agree that that... What's the matter, John? $750 a week, plus expenses, when there's only a $5,000 policy involved? That's right. But if this four-year-old Laird Douglas Douglas of... of, of, of Heather Scott. Yeah. If he's only worth a $5,000 policy, what was that crack about short life expectancy? John, I told you he is already four years old. He... Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes, no, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Van Pyten. I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute no, thereafter. No, I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Leia Douglas Douglas... Have Heather Scout. Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. Uh, here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long. You really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all... He is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you, and I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Good, he's awake. Oh, no. That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hey, Oh, Johnny! Douglas, hey, Douglas, Douglas Harry, no! Somebody. Let go of Mr. Dollar's leg. Douglas, dear. Douglas! Johnny Dollar. Ray Rowland, Johnny. Oh, hi, Ray. Just got your message. What are you doing in Philadelphia? Oh, a case for Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, and I may need your help. What do you know about Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Why, he's one of Scotland's finest. Wait a minute. That's your case? Yep. Insurance? And bodyguard. How's about lunch? Johnny, have you met the... Have you met his lairdship? Yeah, and I nearly lost a leg doing it. Oh. Then you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, in connection with my investigation, 
or rather my involvement in the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And I wish I'd had some idea of what I was getting into before I ever left Hartford. But it's too late now. Expense account item three, thirty-nine fifty. One pair of slacks. For within a few minutes of my arrival in Philadelphia, Harry Branson of Philly Mutual buttonholed me and dragged me up to his office to meet two important clients he had. First was Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I am so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me, and I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. And then came... Well, Mrs. Van Pyten made the introduction. Laird Douglas Douglas of Hedderscote, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> Holy jump of the... Douglas, oh, no, you mustn't do that. Oh, my. Douglas, oh, dear, good heavens. Get on oh, your own Douglas. chair, Harry. This no, one's taken. No. Sorry, John. Sorry. Down, Douglas. Down. Oh. There, dear, that's the boy. That's a nice boy. That yes. is now. Laird Douglas Douglas of Hedderscope? Yes, isn't he adorable? He's so playful. He was really just playing, you know. There, dear. Come down. Harry. Yes, John? This is the client you call me all the way down from Hartford to see? Yes, John, yes. Seven fifty a week, practically unlimited expense account. Oh, dear, just look at your trousers, Mr. Dollar. I don't need to, thanks. I can feel the draft. But you'll need new ones. Here. And I insist you let me pay for it. Down, oh, Douglas, oh, oh, oh. down. Here, Mr. Dollar. Will a hundred dollars be enough? Uh, he... No, here, a hundred and fifty. I can see those were very, very nice ones. Well, uh, you see what I mean, John? Here, please, now I insist you take it. And if it isn't no, enough... No, 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 thanks, that's plenty. But now, Harry, you listen to John, me. John, I know what you're going to say, but as I explained to you on the way up you here to my office... You explained plenty, but not nearly enough. But I tried, I really tried. I think boys. you and I had better have a quiet little talk, Harry, and the sooner the better. Oh, boys, please, can't you do that another time? Please come down from those chairs so Mr. Dollar can meet Douglas and we can make all the arrangements. Please? Mrs. Van Pyten, that's precisely what I want to talk about. <laughs> you really look very funny up there. And see, Douglas does want so much to be friends with you. Yeah, you're sure it isn't a piece of my leg he wants. Oh, no, of course not. Here, Mr. Dollar, just give him one of these biscuits. I have them specially baked for him. And he'll be your friend for life. Really? Huh? Here, now just come down and hand it to him. Well, He'll love you. It's true, John, I know. Yeah? Then what are you doing up on that chair? I, I forgot, that's all. Nice, Douglas. Huh? Please, Mr. Dollar. Well, hey, oh, all I hope is he doesn't forget. That's right. Just hand it and to him. And then he knows which is biscuit and which is my hand. Yo, uh, here, boy. Here, boy. Now, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, oh, oh. Now he's your friend, well, isn't that sweet? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Well, well, I'd better get back to my hotel and change it. Harry, I'll call you. Oh, but we haven't made the definite arrangements yet, and I want you staying out at our place in Germantown, the Maples. It's a lovely little place, Mr. Dollar. Well, much as I hate to say it, I'm, I'm not quite sure about taking oh, this Oh, I know. The money. Well, don't you worry about it. Not at all, not one bit. If you'd rather have $1,000 a week, that's what we'll make it. And I do wish Mrs. you'd let Van me Pyton. do more about these poor trousers. I know. Why don't you go straight over to Wanamaker's Men's Store and have them tailor you a whole suit? Wouldn't that be nice? You'd look lovely. You've already it? given me more than enough oh, to buy a suit. Oh, that. Now, just forget it. Now, you have them make you anything you want and just charge it to me. Oh, and look. Douglas Deer is licking your hand. I knew he'd like you. Never underestimate the power of a woman, somebody once said. Or maybe they should have said never underestimate the power of a fast buck or a thousand bucks. Anyhow, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten had set her heart on my handling this whole affair, and she simply wasn't to be denied. Couple that with a chance to pick up enough loot in a few days to, uh... Well, what would you do? And the darn mutt did take a liking to me. So, with Laird Douglas Douglas in my lap... Oh, he's a Scotty, by the way. Scottish Terrier, Mr. Dollar. If you'll pardon my correcting you. Sorry. And it's all because of the show at Bala Kinwid on Friday. Bala where? Uh, B-A-L-A-C-Y-N-W-Y-D, John. Yes, Bala Kinwid. Laird Douglas Douglas simply must win. Not only best of class, but best of show. And he will. 
if somebody doesn't interfere. Oh, you uh, you think somebody might uh, might do something to to uh, Douglas? Here? I'm sure of it, because it's been tried before. You mean poison him or something like that? Worse. Oh? Dope. Poison would let him die a hero, a martyr. But drugs would keep him from winning the show. Oh, I... Well, what makes you suspect somebody might try it? As I said, it's been tried before. Ah. Last year and again a few days ago. And if Harrison R. Kenworthy thinks he can do it again, he's mistaken. Then you know who did it before. I refuse to divulge any names. But you just said... Mr. Dollar, I will not tell you. All I ask is that you watch over Laird Douglas Douglas until he has won the show. Oh, and if he does win, as I'm sure he will... I'll insist that you accept a nice bonus so you can see I'm very, very serious. And so it went on for another half hour or so. And finally she left after I'd promised to pick up my bags at the hotel and move out to her joint in fashionable Germantown. I talked a few minutes longer with Harry Branson. I'm so glad you've agreed to take this on, John. As I told you, Mrs. Van Pyten is the most important individual policyholder we have, and doing this favor Harry, for Harry, us... it's not the Mutt Show at Bella Kinwood or Laird Douglas or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten or you I'm doing this for. It's purely love of the green stuff. Whew. That old dame must be really loaded. John, she has so much money, she... Well, she doesn't know how much she has. Industrial empire, that sort of thing. All right, all right. But Harry... If word ever gets around in the trade that I came down here to play bodyguard to a mutt, so help me, I'll have your head. <clears throat> yes. Uh, but now, hadn't you better go on out to the Maples? Well, first I want to know about this Harrison R. Kenworthy she mentioned. Oh, that. Yeah, that. She accused him of doping up her Scotty. Well, she really doesn't. No, and it, it's really quite complicated. What do you mean? Kenworthy owns a beautiful Kerry Blue Terrier, Lady Odetti's Roller Mame. Lady o Holy cats, and no pun. Why can't they give an honest dog an honest name? Look, we'll call her Mimi. Go ahead. Hi, dog lovers. Ray, just in time. Meet Harry Branson, Ray Rowland. Oh, we know each other. Hello, Harry boy. Mr. Rowland. Sure, Harry called me in last year when these two dogs were at each other's Of course, throat. he doesn't mean that literally, John. You see, Mr. Rowland is quite an authority on show animals. I've held it against him for years, ever since school. Well, there's no need to hold it against him. And I don't mean to... that literally. Oh. Well, John, boy, so you came down to help yourself to a handful of dear Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten's coin. More power to you. I knew Harry would call you in on the case. Felt it in my bones. And, brother, you may be in deeper than you think. Oh? What's that supposed to mean, Ray? Has Harry told you about the villain of the piece, Harrison R. Kenworthy? I was just starting to when you so rudely... Yeah, well, Johnny, the whole setup is a riot, but just remember one thing. Yeah? A lot of people have been killed in riots. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I'll tell you what he means, Let I me even... tell it, Harry. It would take you all day. Uh, sorry, no offense. It's all right. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Okay, Bella Kenwood is the biggest event of the year in the doggy set, okay? Okay. All right. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten owns Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Real fine Scotty. Yeah, good tea, see? Hey, those pants are really gone. Anyhow, Harrison Kenworthy owns Lady O'Diddy's Rolamar Meme, Carrie Blue. Mimi. Huh? I'd get indigestion trying to say that other name. Okay, Mimi. They're two pretty good dogs, especially Mimi, international championship blood and all that. But Mimi's the better dog. Douglas won't stand a chance. I've tried to tell her this, but... Well, go on, go on. Okay. Harrison Kenworthy loves Kelly Van Pyten, see? Oh, loves her money. Him? He's loaded, too. No, I think the old coot really loves her, and I think she loves him. Right, Harry? Yes, I think I'm inclined right, to... Right, but now get this. Yeah? She won't marry him until her Laird Douglas beats his Lady O'Diddy, uh, uh Mimi, yeah. far and squire at the Balakinwood show. How do you like that? Are you kidding? Oh, no, John, it's an accepted fact. Right, his... so what happens for over wait a year Wait a minute, now, Ray, wait a minute. If he really wants to marry her, why doesn't he just let her dog beat his? And let her be one up on him right from the start? Never, no, boy, he'd never live it down. You don't know these people. Well, this is about the craziest thing I ever heard of. To you and me, sure, but to them it's deadly serious. Are they in love with each other or with their dogs? Well, it's not just love where the dogs are concerned, but pride, which is just about all a lot of these old lonely millionaires have to think about, to live for. Yea, sometimes even unto the fifth and sixth generation. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. But now she said something about her dog being doped at the show last year. Oh, yes, John. You see, it was just a couple of days... Right, just before the finals. It was an attempt to murder the dog with poison. But emergency care both times pulled Laird Douglas through. She told me it was only some kind of a dope that oh, was Oh, sure, sure. We kept the truth from her. You don't realize it, boy, but if that dog were to die, she would. Fact. Oh, now, Ray. Oh, yes, John, and the insurance company must keep that dog alive in order to obviate having to pay off... Right. Her... 
After all, her policies amount to... Right. (laughs) It may sound absurd to you, Johnny, but it's no joke. As I said, you don't know these people. But look, it still doesn't make any sense. You just have to take my word for it, and it's happened right here in Philadelphia. Yes, John, and we held the policy. It was an old lady... Right, so there you have it. (sighs) Okay, okay, I'll, I'll believe you. And so the finger points at Harrison R. Kenworth. Well, she might like to think that, uh, especially since she doesn't know that poison was used both times, but I don't. What's more, the police feel the same. Oh, now, if you say police dogs, I'll slug you. John, there are times when the sense of right, humor of Harry, yours... dead right, and I do mean dead. No, in all seriousness, Johnny, if I were you, I'd duck out of this assignment. Now, don't say that, Ray, unless John no, is... No, 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 go, go ahead and say it. Something ought to start to make sense around here. All right, listen. The reason I'm sure Harrison R. Kenworthy had nothing to do with the attempted poisonings, the reason the police were called in, the reason I think you ought to get get out of this... Will you get to the point, Ray? On each occasion, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten had a bodyguard attending Laird Douglas, in addition to the dog's governess and medicos and so on. Get to the point. Each time, in order for the poisoner to get to that dog... Ray, please. Each time, the bodyguard was murdered. Still want this case, Johnny? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, the joke's no longer a joke. Especially when a killer trains his sights on me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, pretty lighthearted up until the end. The hint that this could get really serious, deadly serious for Johnny when we get back to the story on Friday. I will admit I got a little bit confused regarding the pants. Now, $39 may not sound much for a pair of pants, but in today's money, that's $443. I just never imagined Johnny as the type of guy who walked around wearing $400 pairs of pants. But then again, she referred him to Watermakers, which really was a high-end clothing store. They sold Clipper Craft suits, which was a sponsor of the 1947 to 49 New York City based Sherlock Holmes radio program. But what was confusing is that she gave him money for the suit, which I assume some of that was intended to be for the aggravation of Laird Douglas Douglas destroying Johnny's trousers. 
as if that was intended to just be a replacement price. Uh, she was totally out of touch with the cost of clothing. I'm not even going to bother to run that through a inflation calculator because at whatever that would come out to, that's the tax you would wear to a big award show. But then Johnny claims this as an item on the expense account. So Johnny is obviously not going to put an item on his expense account that an insured already compensated him for. So he must be putting that towards his $1,000 retainer, right? Right? Now, it's interesting that Jack Johnstone decides to use the name of real businesses. Not only watermakers, but he also referenced the Benjamin Franklin Hotel and spoke of it favorably. Usually, if that happened in a modern-day program, that would be like a product placement. Here, I think Johnstone was just trying to add in genuine local flavor. Benjamin Franklin opened in 1920. It was built on the site of the Continental Hotel, which had opened back in 1860. The Benjamin Franklin would continue to operate for years to come. Although it faced decline in the 1970s, there was hope that the bicentennial would lead to a rush of tourists and help them to turn things around. But unfortunately, that didn't happen and the hotel was closed in 1980. And it was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1982. It reopened as the Benjamin Franklin House with the intent of featuring apartments and office space. Currently, the Ben features luxury apartments and the old hotel ballroom is rented out for banquets and weddings. And for listeners who are familiar with Philadelphia, the location of the hotel also gives them an idea of where Harry Branson's office is. Now to listener comments and feedback. Over on Instagram, Rabbi Dude writes, Regarding the Lamar matter, this was definitely a wow. Over on Facebook, regarding the Fathom 5 matter, Eric writes in response to a listener suggestion that the changing actors and personalities of Johnny Dollar could have a science fiction explanation. Johnny regenerating like Doctor Who from the uh, British TV series. Eric says, I like the Time Lord idea. Yep, my head canon is now that there are three major Time Lords. The Master, the Doctor, and the Insurance Investigator. I will never argue with someone's headcanon because obviously that's just what people think. I will say that if you go with that as a headcanon, then the really later episodes, like from the Mandel Kramer era, where every other case Johnny is just hanging around Hartford, are even more a wasted potential. As you have all of time and space and you end up spending it all in Hartford, Connecticut. Thanks for the comment, Eric. Richard uh, writes regarding the Clinton matter, This is one of my favorite stories in the Johnny Dollar series. Thanks for uploading. Also over on YouTube, we have some comments uh, regarding the final episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. A listener writes uh, regarding the uh, suspect in drive-in. He openly attempted to murder a Texas Ranger and he was only charged with armed robbery. This is why in the 70s they came up with mandatory minimums. And uh, Terrence writes, Thanks for the show history. Still can't believe some people actually had the first small home TVs in 1939. I considered commercial TV began in 1947. Well, it's complicated. The first uh, TV sets uh, installed in private homes were in 1928. Uh, which had an experimental broadcast. And you could tune in and see a woman smoking, followed by a man playing the ukulele. That's the sort of thing you get to enjoy if you are an early adopter of new technology. By 1946, there were 8,000 television sets uh, in the United States. 
and obviously broadcast were rare. Although there was actually a Boston Blackie episode that uh, was released in December 1945 where Blackie was watching a TV program where Inspector Faraday was on and someone was about to expose a criminal and then they were poisoned by the water. Now, the TV was not actually all that essential, but it was viewed as something that was interesting enough to include in the program. But we didn't actually have regular primetime programming starting on all the networks until about 1948. And then television just kind of steamrolled, gained momentum, sold a lot of sets. But really, before 1948, you're kind of in an era of cultural oddity and kind of out there from the mainstream of culture, and then it just kind of picked up and took over. And then we have a comment from Gary who writes, On the recent podcast of Indictment, you commented on the strange, creepy voice Sheldon Leonard used on the Armed Forces uh, commercial. He was using the same voice he used on the Jack Benny show, where he semi-regularly played a horse uh, race track tout He would always use the voice and start the bit with whispering to Jack, Hey bud, come here. Well, thanks for the clarification, Gary. And that makes sense of the commercial. Because out of context, it doesn't sound like all that effective of a sales technique for what the AFRS was trying to sell. But if it tied into something that people understood from something as popular as the Jack Benny program, and that makes a lot of sense. I have to admit that I've not listened to a ton of Jack Benny episodes. I know it's one of the bigger, more popular old-time radio programs, and definitely very significant, but I tend to gravitate more towards obscure programs that no one is uh, talking about or remembers. And since my ears only have a limited amount of time, that means that there are some very popular old-time radio programs I've heard very little of. So I appreciate the clarification, Gary. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to James, Patreon supporter since June of 2015, currently supporting the podcast at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, James. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you are enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help the channel to grow, along with leaving a comment. We will conclude the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter on Friday, but join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... You think these buzz bomb boys would have found out we tipped off the delegates to this meeting not to show up? Well, I don't see how. We tipped them off personally, so as far as anybody else knows, the delegates should be arriving any minute now. Hold it. What is it? Looks like somebody else is arriving. And that little guy coming along the sidewalk, this side of the street? Yeah. Look at him. Pretty fidgety. Yeah, he's trying to look in every direction at once. Stop. Look, he's staring at the entrance of the building. Let's close in real easy. Right. Think he's our boy? I don't know. Look at the way he's sweating, will you? I'd sweat too if I was about to blow myself up. Keeps making false starts across the street. Probably trying to get up nerve. Mm -hmm. I thought these bonsai boys never hesitated. So did I. Look, when we grab them, grab them easy. Don't worry. I've got no desire to go up in smoke. This mother... Look! Yeah. He sees us. Starting to run. Come on. Deck into that alley. Yeah, after him. Come on, we're gaining on him. I got him. Please, please don't let go. Pull his coat back first. All right, come on. Oh, brother, will you look at that? Yeah. Dynamite strapped all around Steve, him. Steve, keep his arm steady. He's got a wire leading to one hand. Yeah, yeah, I, I see it. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. 
Instagram.com slash Great Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.